and we're going to be talking about moving from inequality to inclusion. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Secretary General Angel Gurria, who's from Mexico and was formerly Mexico's Minister of Foreign Affairs as well as uh, Mexico's uh, Finance Minister. Since he's been Secretary General since June of 2006, there have been a number of additional members to have joined the OECD, including Chile, Estonia, Israel, and Slovenia, so for a total of 34. The OECD is one of the most important multilateral organizations some people have never heard of but should know about. It's actually really one of the most really important organizations. It's a standard setter and has a number of important uh, components to it, including PISA, which is the world-renowned uh, uh, analysis of uh, education uh, performance, as well as the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee for the Development World, which is also the, um, in essence, it's the, uh, it's the Major League Baseball Commission for Foreign Assistance, or uh, for those of you who think about the World Cup, it's the FIFA of Foreign Assistance, as well as many other, uh, there's uh, focus on taxes, on trade, uh, and it's really a, it's sort of a global think tank that I think had its origins, I think to be fair, in the, in the Marshall Plan, if I think if that's a fair way to describe it. Um, Secretary John Gurria speaks six languages, or five and a half, as German is, is mas o menos, but speaks uh, five languages very fluently. His wife's an ophthalmologist, he has adult children, and it's a very um, great pleasure to welcome you here to CSIS. Secretary General, please join me up here. Well, thanks a lot, Don, and, and thank you for joining us today uh, um, when so many things are happening, the Stanley Cup and the NBA, and uh, that's a little later, but uh, certainly the opening of the World Cup. Um, and uh, let me uh, say that uh, together with uh, me today are my colleagues in here. I'll go from left to right. Um, uh, Lamia and Mr. Morrison and uh, Stefano and Jill and uh, over there uh, Carol uh, who is the head of our uh, Washington Center. But um, this is uh, the team that is working. Where is Luis? Where is Luis de Mello? There. This is the group uh, and Miguel who is works on here at the uh, office here uh, on communications and, um, and media issues. But um, this is the group that is working on this issue. Um, that originally started working on 10 years ago on inequality and that now is uh, when inequality has become mainstream, uh, the issue of inequality has become mainstream and the bestseller is about inequality and the President of the United States says this is going to be the defining issue and the rest of the administration, blah, 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 all this, fine, you know, the IMF is working on inequality, the World Bank is working on inequality, fine, we're happy and comfortable that it has become mainstream, but at the same time, so what do we do with it? You know, now, if everybody agrees on the diagnosis and everybody agrees on how bad it is and what a, much of a problem it is, what do we do with it? What are the answers to that? And this is a little bit of what we're talking about today. So I'm delighted to be here at the CSIS. Thank you very much, Monsieur. Uh, monsieur. Uh, we're, we're bilingual, so it's a... Uh, for the past 50 years, the institution has been dedicated to driving prosperity in the United States, but also peace in the world. This is an ideal place to address the challenges of inequality and the need to foster inclusive growth. As you know from the chorus of voices calling for greater equality, President Obama and President Bachelet, just to name a few, um, the issue of inequality has moved to the mainstream of politics and policymaking and the center stage of the international policy arena. It is one of the most urgent issues threatening the lives of Americans and so of many people around the world. The OECD has been at the forefront of this issue, not least since the publication of our path-breaking study, Growing Unequal. It had a question mark. This was as far back as 2008, and it had numbers to up to before the crisis. However, of course, we started working three years before. So already by 2008, we'd been working for three years on this question when nobody thought it was a very hot issue or a very relevant issue. 
And in 2008, we had a question mark in our title. And in 2011, we removed the question mark. And we produced another book that's, that was called Divided We Stand. And the subtitle was Why Inequality Keeps Growing. And now, uh, Stefano, you're going to come up with the third opus uh, early uh, next year. Uh, which is going to look hard at the question of the labor market and the sources of the inequalities and how that has come along. So I say this because for an institution, let me just make a little adjustment. I would never dare say a correction, but a little adjustment. She said it was a think tank, and we are a do tank, <laughs> not a think tank, because we are policy oriented, we are action oriented. Uh, rather than rather than a, a think tank, but other than that, he, it was a very generous and very nice uh, presentation. Um, uh, so, since since uh, this you know th this work uh, was put out, we made great advances with our members uh, and the partner countries to address this growing divide, uh, or this uh, you know greater and greater divide very worrisome divide between the rich and the poor. So let me take a moment to share some of the key results. Inequalities are indisputably rising, first point. The enduring idea that the rising tide of economic growth lifts all boats is no longer a universal truth. In the US, even before the Great Recession, the poorest were steadily losing ground. Between 2000 and 2012, the average disposable income of the bottom 10% in the United States fell by 14%. At the same time, top incomes have soared to dizzying heights as the richest 0.1% earn 8% of national pre-tax income. And by comparison, the top 0.1% account for 4 to 5 percent of total pre-tax incomes in Canada. So Canada is half as unequal in that sense. Um, uh, and they're very proud of it. I just came back from Canada you know, yesterday. And the UK, Switzerland also have about half. Um, and uh, it's about 3 percent in Australia, New Zealand, and France. So. Um, they're even more equal, let's say. Uh, widening inequalities of outcomes, like income, which reflect growing inequality of opportunity. So it's not just a question of, the, of measuring the revenue uh, from a job or from not having a job, which is the ultimate uh, consequence. It is increasingly difficult for low-paid workers to climb the social ladder. Over the past few decades, low-paid Americans have worked harder and harder, increasing their average annual working hours by 20 percent. But their incomes are falling. They are failing to see the fruits of their labor. Most worryingly, inequality risks becoming entrenched as low-paid workers struggle to afford quality education for their children. So here is a problem of very great consequence to our generation today, but which threatens to be transmitted to the next generation. What is driving this trend? Well, advances in technology, while a key driver of economic growth, generally increase salaries and opportunities for the highly skilled, leaving those with intermediate or low skills behind. On top of this, many countries have undertaken pro-competition reforms in goods and services markets. This is good for productivity and growth. It's great for productivity and growth, actually. But it has polarized wages and, again, affected the poorest most, the ones who do not have the skills, and made it more difficult for the ones who the crisis hit the hardest, the low-skilled young males, okay? It makes it 
more difficult for them to be picked up by the recovery, by the, the new growth. And inequality is not, as I said, just about income. It goes far beyond it and has become truly multidimensional. And um, so this, this brings us to the obvious conclusion that this is not about inequality, but this is about inequalities. There are several inequalities which conspire and kind of reinforce each other. In our publication, All on Board, this is the reply to the inequality issue. I said before, okay, so we do a diagnosis, we do a quantification, we do some benchmarking, but then we point to the solutions and now we're moving or proposing the actions. Now, this I have to say, Anna Marie, um, from the Ford Foundation, uh, we, we did it together with the Ford Foundation. We're very proud to launch this. Some of you actually were there, Heather, and uh, um, some of you uh, accompanied us that, that day in New York, uh, precisely to look at what we can do with, uh, the, um, with the, the inequality challenge uh, by focusing on some of the policies uh, that we have to adopt and adapt. And in this all on board, and by the way, here the coordinator of the work and uh, the main, uh, you know, this Lamia has now run out of uh, many pieces of uh, pencils and, uh, and uh, uh, Lamia uh, and, and here, uh, Luis over there, I, I introduced you a while ago. He's coordinating this work and, uh, and Lamia is uh, uh, part of the team. Um, actually, and they're, and they're a team of two, so that's all, that's all you get. <laughs> um, no, it's actually uh, a, a very, very important horizontal work. All of the OECD is involved, and they're the ones who are coordinating the work and making sure that the, the people in ELSA, you know, uh, Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs, the people in ECHO, in economics, the people in health, the people uh, in education, and the people in uh, science and technology and innovation, uh, that everybody is on board, as the publication is called, all on board, um, for um, our proposals. So we find that rising income inequality is also accompanied by greater polarization in education and health outcomes. Perhaps intuitive, what we have done is documented benchmarked and quantified that. Our most recent survey of adult skills, I mentioned PISA as the very well-known product of the OECD and the uh, uh, Program for International Student Assessment, but the PIAC is a very new product. It's called the Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies. Um, and this most recent survey of adult skills revealed that socioeconomic background has a stronger impact on adult literacy skills in the United States than in other countries. What have I just said? Very difficult to even understand what I just said. What our analysis reflects is that in the U.S., your social economic background is weighing more heavily on your performance than most other OECD countries. That which would look like natural or even intuitively maybe appropriate is very bad. Because if you happen to be from a uh, vulnerable and from a uh, you know, family that it was had low skills, low education, um, it means that the children are going to be um, disenfranchised or are going to have lesser opportunities than the rest of their cohort because of the weight of the um, uh, past generation. So um, literacy skills 
are linked and have actually a very great bearing on health or to health. In 2008, the highest educated white males in the United States were expected to live 14 years longer than the lowest educated African Americans. This is not between an African country and the United States. This is in the United States. Now, let me just tell you, it won't make you feel any better, but I just, as I said, I just came back from Montreal, and we just rolled out a, um, uh, we just rolled out a, uh, an analysis about skills and jobs, and we went very, very local. We went to Ontario and to Quebec, and then we went to very small towns in Ontario, to Thunder Bay, and to Hamilton, and then to Estrie and Merisi, etc. And uh, we would there have, in some cases, from the better off to the worst off, you could have. Uh, because of the type of work and uh, mining and whatever and extraction, you could have even sometimes even 30 years of life expectancy uh, differences. Uh, and so uh, this is it, OECD countries. You know, these are some of the richest, better off countries in the world. We're not talking again uh, about uh, Africa or Asia or Latin America. So it's a, it's a big wake up call. Now. To address inequalities, we believe, um, you know, address inequalities in incomes, in, in health outcomes, in education, and well-being in general, we need to drastically reconsider our approach to policy making and our policy tools. We need to focus more on policy synergies and a more tailored approach to policy making that targets disadvantaged social groups. For example, in our approach to education, we need to create a more level playing field for disadvantaged pupils. Again, to break the link between disadvantaged parents and a low performance in uh, the school of the new generation. This begins by examining our inequality measurement tools. Let's start with a bogeyman. The bogeyman enters every policymaker's room and agitates, you know. He's called Mr. Average. And who is Mr. Average? Well, Mr. Average doesn't exist. He's a statistical construct. Simply looking at Mr. Average fails to capture, in fact, hides the wide disparities among social groups. And we feel oh so comfortable because we captured the average. Examining instead the entire distribution of incomes, the whole range of income distribution, will help strengthen our policies, which is also fundamentally about growth. By the way, somebody was asking me today, Mr. Korea, this is about um, um, distribution policies, and I said, no way. It's about growth. It's about growth. And just like we say green growth, and effectively only where to go, well, inclusive growth, we say only where to go. Now, I was sharing with some of you that I've been advised, particularly here in Washington, to say, Inclusive growth. <laughs> Inclusive growth. <laughs> no, you say you'll be politically correct. Mm. Well, we're not interested in being politically correct, uh, but we also think that this is policy correct to say out loud, you know, inclusive growth, and that that is the way to go. That that is the way things will, will work, and that that will get better outcomes by. Uh, saying that the two go together and must go together. In fact, it's the only way it's going to work. So um, forget about Mr. Average and uh, take a hard look at the, um, the numbers, the whole, as I said, the whole distribution of the incomes. Um, 
New work underway at the OECD confirms that the vicious cycle of inequality harms economic growth. Those at the bottom of the ladder rarely have the opportunity to increase their earnings potential and therefore rarely have the opportunity to contribute to economic growth. They are, in a way, kept in a certain confine and they will stay there. Let's remember that growth and equity are natural bedfellows. Without growth, there's no way we can raise people's living standards. But how can we drive inclusive growth, particularly given the new constraints of low demand in a post-crisis environment? We're not starting from zero. We're not creating the perfect world we'd like to in order to create inclusive growth. We are starting from still the throes of the longest, deepest, widest, most severe economic crisis in our lifetime, with all the known consequences, including budgetary consequences and constraints. Now, to help policymakers lay the foundation for inclusive, equitable, sustainable growth, we've launched the Inclusive Growth Initiative, which I told you about, and again, Thank you to the Ford Foundation for their support. This is still pretty much work in progress, by the way, but it provides an analytical policy framework to identify the adverse effects of rising inequality on growth. I'm going to tell you a little in a while. We quantified a little bit of this impact, and it's pretty dramatic. The bottom line is that there doesn't have to be a trade-off between the growth and equality greater inclusiveness, the opening up of economic opportunity will act as drivers, not dampeners of strong economic performance. Our approach is first and foremost multidimensional. We take account of income, but also non-income related outcomes. We mentioned employment and health, among others, in order to provide a more accurate picture of people's living standards. It also places a great deal of importance on the distribution of these multi-dimensional outcomes. That's the distribution within the population to consider the effects that individual policies will have on specific social groups, such as the poor or the median household. Again, move away from Mr. Average. And our framework is about identifying actionable policy recommendations. This helps policymakers identify, analyze, and exploit synergies among policies that can boost both equity and growth, and also to take compensatory action when trade-offs are present. Now, what does this mean in a country like the United States? Earlier this year, I launched a, an action plan that had Four pillars to lay the foundation for more inclusive growth in the United States. And this is the um, brochure that we are providing you uh, today. Uh, and that is um, these, these four pillars. Uh, the first pillar calls for investing in education and skills to empower the poorest in society. This will help over the long run by reducing wage polarization, increasing employment, and promoting social mobility, something that is sorely lacking. Ensuring equal access to high quality education and ensuring equal access also to training opportunities can enhance individual well-being and benefit society at large. It will broaden the tax base it will increase the pool of skilled workers, but it takes time. It's not a quick fix, but it's a win-win. Secondly, labor market policies need to focus on reactivation measures. So one is about education, skills. The other one is about reactivation measures to bring disadvantaged groups closer to employment. 
In recent years, we've seen labor market participation in the U.S. edging down toward 60 percent of the population compared to pre-crisis levels that were closer to 65 percent. And of course, the U.S. spends, please, the U.S. spends only one quarter of what the OECD countries spend on average on reactivation policies, meaning connecting the unemployed to the jobs that are available. Okay? Now, here we have a very dramatic measure. It's not that this is alien, not that people are not doing it, it's the U.S. is not doing it. Not doing it enough. It's doing it at 25 percent. It's like an engine that is only moving at 25 percent of its potential power. Therefore, you're going to go at 25 percent speed. Now, by implementing reactivation policies that are more family friendly or provide women better access to jobs, the U.S. can mobilize more talent to boost growth. And I would say you know, the U.S. is not the problem, is not the country where the problem of women and women's jobs is the greatest, but it is going to increasingly become, to the extent that we do not address it, um, already there are countries like Japan, the oldest on average in the OECD, or Korea, which is the third youngest today, and it's going to be the second oldest in 2050 because of the demographics, uh, where they're, I'd say, pretty clearly one of their most important sources of hope for a more dynamic economy is precisely to get women on board. And these are societies which are known to have much lower levels of participation of women in the labor market. Well, here it's a few percentage points, but it's one area where the U.S., you know, open society should be leading, like in so many other things, and it's behind. Now, countries like Australia, countries like Denmark, they have a wealth of experience to share on the successful design and activation programs. In addition, the U.S. survey, the U.S. economic survey, which I will present tomorrow, this is the second deliverable we're going to do in this short stay, uh, our e U.S. economic survey by the OECD. It recommends a range of policy measures to help parents better reconcile their work and their family lives. So um, this is part, again, of the reactivation policies. Third, let's look hard at our tax and benefit systems to ensure a fair distribution of the benefits of economic growth. Well-targeted support helps prevent low-income families from sliding further down the ladder. I'll repeat this. Well-targeted support helps prevent low-income families from sliding further down the ladder. In the U.S., taxes and transfers reduce income inequality among the working age population by about 20 percent. That number is 30 percent in France. It's slightly upwards of 30 percent in Germany. So take two situations just as unequal. Throw at them the taxes, throw at them the payments for Social Security, but also throw the delivery of services. And what do you have at the end? In Europe, in most countries in Europe, you reduce the inequality by a third. In the United States, you reduce inequality by a fifth. Again, it has to do with things we can change. It has to do with the, the design of our policies, both of the taxes and of the benefits. Now, this means the U.S. has room for maneuver when reviewing both minimum wage levels and instruments such as the Earned Income Tax Credit. I recently delivered the economic survey of Germany. 
And there was a big, I delivered it with Sigmar Gabriel, who is the deputy chancellor. And he's the head of the junior coalition member of the uh, socialists. And of course, they were very happy to hear that we were very strongly supporting the minimum wage in um, increase. Uh, well, actually, minimum wage period. They, they don't have one in Germany. To 850, um, 850 euros per hour, uh, which is kind of you know below France and below Belgium and um, you know at, at more or less average uh, uh, in Europe. It's not uh, anything to write home about. But they don't have one. In practice, it happens that they do have in certain sectors and it works well. But it will benefit the lowest, which were very poorly paid. Well, um, I'd say the same thing about the United States, that um, the 1010 that is being proposed, again, is not going to you know, get the cost of uh, work uh, uh, through the ceiling, but it will help to address this particular issue that we're talking about today. We're talking about how do you empower the lowest echelon of the workforce by Skilling by education, by focusing on their uh, inclusion into the workforce, but also by increasing their um, uh, consumption capacity, or at least by making sure that there is a, um, a safety net or a, a limit, a lower limit. Now, as top earners now have a greater capacity to um, uh, pay taxes than before, uh, I was asked today, is, it, is this about inequality by taxing the rich? And this is one of the dangers of looking at this issue like this. And this is perhaps, uh, let me just say that, uh, you know, with the, this, this book by Piketty, which uh, has a number of very interesting considerations, but the fact that it is recommending that you just go and tax the rich or that you tax inheritance or that you tax it, uh, makes it look like this is the easy way out. And what we're looking here is that you're looking at education, you're looking at innovation, you're looking at more competition, and you're looking at special programs, and you're looking, and we're saying that takes time. And just saying tax the rich or tax inheritance or taxes is, looks like there is a quick fix and that it won't cause distortions and it won't cause misallocation of resources. So again, I would invite you to um, take a, a very serious look or very comprehensive view uh, of the whole thing. And, but here, you know, again, uh, raising marginal income uh, tax rates um, or simply, do people pay the taxes they're supposed to pay? Tax compliance, fighting tax evasion, and this is by individuals but also by the larger companies. Uh, you know, we're involved in uh, base erosion and profit shifting uh, issues. Um, eliminate regressive tax expenditures, meaning all the breaks. Um, reassess the role of taxes on property and wealth. Why? Because, again, we believe that it is less distortive to tax property uh, than um, it is to increase the taxes on um, the um, uh, benefits of uh, companies or you know, profits of companies or to tax more uh, the revenue of workers or to tax more the companies in the way of um, contributions to social security. Why? Because the logic of this all is we want companies to have more appetite to create more jobs. Therefore, you should reduce the cost of creating more jobs. You know, this is the, the arithmetical logic. But it has to be assured that the state, that the government, has the minimum of revenue that it will require in order to discharge their obligations. To whom? Mostly to the more vulnerable, precisely to help them move up the ladder. Now, the fourth and final pillar concerns public services. So, you know, we've talked about, um, we've talked about um, education and skills, talked about reactivation measures, we talked about the tax and benefit systems, uh, and now 
public services. Now, in the United States, spending on cash benefits has a much lower incidence than across the OECD. In many countries in the United States, you get the benefits in cash. In the United States, the fact that most of this is through services or some benefits, it is particularly important for Americans to have equal access or at least better access to health, family care, and other social services because they are great equalizers. But to be equalizers, you have to be able to access them. And I say this in the United States, in the capital of the United States, to people to whom this may seem like, say, why is he saying this? You know, well, because if you're a European audience, you would not understand what I'm saying. Because you would take it for granted that you go to the pharmacy to get your cheap medicines or you don't pay anything medicines and that you go to the doctor to get your cheap doctor and no or no pay anything doctor in a way and that uh, you you have uh, the education all the way from kindergarten to the university and you go that is not the case in the united states and because it's not the case in the united states because you still have a lot of co-payments and because you still have to pay for a lot of education because you have to pay for then the question of the delivery of the services by the government becomes doubly important if you want to address the question of inequality. So, you know, I don't want to overdo the point, but it's quite critical. Um, making health insurance coverage universal, for example, and I know this is a very controversial issue here in the United States, but I have to say, you know, we, we, we testified in the Senate in favor of, of course, going universal only uh, the United States and Mexico in the OECD are the only ones who uh, are not, do not have universal coverage. Mexico is now about 95%, so that leaves the U.S. as the only one that did not or still does not have cover. Um, so uh, this is a welcome move to reduce health inequalities. But the most vulnerable will need additional attention from policymakers to compensate from bad health outcomes non-financial barriers to health care, um, and the same applies to other services. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rundi and dear friends, the U.S. and the OECD have always been strong partners. Today, I attended the swearing-in ceremony of Daniel Johannes, your new ambassador to the OECD, a fine professional, former banker, a very successful and committed civil servant in the field of development and the support of the poorest countries in the world, very welcome to uh, our work uh, at the OECD. And um, hopefully with his partnership, with your partnership, with your guidance, and I thank uh, our friends from state from the Department of Agriculture and other areas of the United States um, um, government here, the Department of Labor and others. Um, we can actually um, steer the U.S. towards the vision of social mobility and unlimited opportunity that it so aptly symbolizes throughout the world. It's a bit of a paradox that we have all these pending issues, such a lot of homework, uh, when the world is looking to you, uh, precisely, as the example. To unleash the unique American spirit, its relentless commitment to hard work, and its thirst for innovation, we need to create a more level playing field to enable every American to flourish. This is the only way forward in an increasingly competitive and globalized world. So together, let's do better policies for better lives. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. What I think what we're going to do is I'll have you sit down, and then I'm going to have the, the panelists respond to, uh, to what you had to say. Very thoughtful, very constructive. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the two panelists to join me. Uh, Dr. Heather Bushi, who's the Executive Director and Chief Economist of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, as well as Dr. Aparna Mathur, who's a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Let's, let's get right into it. Thank you both for being here. I thought that that was uh, very thought-provoking and very constructive. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. Um, let me first start with, I thought that the OECD has been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, I thought it was very sobering analysis. Uh, it's now a hot topic. There's often um, trends and uh, various sort of fads in economic development, and uh, there's a little bit of a, because of course there's this book uh, that's also been, uh, also has been involved with the, making this an important issue. Um, is the conversation moving in the right way, or is this just, an, uh, is just another uh, flash in the pan? So I'd like to hear from you first, Dr. Bushi, please. Um, well, I certainly don't think it's a, a, a flash in the pan. I don't know how many folks in the audience caught the, uh, the recent issue of uh, Bloomberg Businessweek that had uh, what I would refer to as a Tiger Beat-esque cover of Thomas Piketty and some other folks. I mean, it seems like uh, this issue of inequality and what it means for econ the economy has certainly captured the public's imagination and the bestseller lists and um, certainly the attention of policymakers here in Washington. Um, I, I had a few remarks that I had prepared that I, I wanted to say in reaction to, to what the Secretary said. Um, you know, I think it's very, uh, this is a very exciting and I think very timely topic. Um, I am the executive director of a brand new center here in, Was in uh, Washington, D.C. called the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And we are focused on exactly this question, what makes economies grow and whether and how does economic inequality affect economic growth and stability. And um, so we've been spending a lot of time digging into the research and thinking about these questions. And I think I would um, very much agree with um, two early comments that the Secretary said. I mean, first of all, we also consider ourselves a do tank, which I like that phrase. And um, second, uh, I very much agree that this is about growth. For a long time, we thought of issues around inequality primarily about um, either poverty or just thinking about what's happening at, at one place of the income distribution. But I think that this conversation about what this means for economic growth and job creation is the economic conversation we need to be having. Um, there is a growing pile of economic evidence that shows that there is a relationship between what is happening to families in terms of inequality and what that means for economic outcomes. Um, one of the most cited papers over the past um, you know, recent time period on this has been recent work by Jonathan Ostry and Andrew Berg that they'd done a couple of years ago, and then a new paper they've done with, um, I'm going to totally mangle this name, Cholumbas Sigandaris, I, I, I apologize, um, for, on a paper that um, from the IMF called Redistribution, Inequality, and Growth, where they look at a variety of countries and find that inequality um, has an a negative effect on the strength of economic growth in countries around the world. And then this new research they find that actually countries with lower net inequality, inequality after redistribution, have faster and more durable economic growth. That is a really important finding, um, one that is true for countries around the world, because of course it's an IMF study, and I'm very sort of heartened to see that the, I, that the OECD has been looking at this just for OECD countries. Uh, a, 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 a document that we sort of found on the OECD webpage yesterday uh, shows that in a new, what I, I understand to be a hot off the press report, showing that a 1% decline in, gro in inequality in OECD countries uh, can reduce GDP by anywhere from 0 0.6 to 1.1%. These are real economic impacts. Um, and I would add to that, um, because the Secretary brought it up in, in a recent paper that I did with uh, John, Sm John Schmidt and Eileen Applebaum, we actually found that the movement of women um, into the workforce over the past few decades has actually increased U.S. economic growth by 11 percent. So the way that inequality plays out in an economy has real implications for how economies grow, which means that it has real implications for job creation, which is in turn sort of how families are faring in the economy. So all of these things are very much intertwined and connected. Um, 
One of the things, though, that I think that makes this a very challenging area to understand is that while there are some studies that look across countries, really I think that the biggest and the most interesting and important questions are how. How does inequality actually affect economic growth and stability? What are the mechanisms that this plays out in an economy? Um, this is sort of a macroeconomic phenomena, but how is it actually um, playing out in, in different communities and in different kinds of institutional structures? Um, so this is, this is specifically the question we are um, looking at it at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And we have been thinking about this in four buckets. Um, first and foremost, how is it that inequality affects the development of human capital? Uh, second, we've been thinking about how is it that inequality affects economic demand? Uh, third, how does it affect the development of our institutions? And then fourth, um, how does it affect the opportunities for entrepreneurship? Um, you know, we have found a variety, uh, in a variety of ways that uh, that, that, that you can see ev economic evidence for inequality uh, affecting the economy through each of these mechanisms. And I just want to point to some recent research in just a couple of areas. Um, first, in terms of human capital, there is a growing amount of evidence that, you know, certainly we all know that talent is very important, and we know that that's what makes economies grow. But there's also increasing evidence, uh, quite frankly, a consensus in the economics literature that what happens to young children is very important for future human capital development. But of course, here in the United States, not only do we not make investments in children that other countries make, we don't have universal pre-K, we don't have universal child care programs, but we also have spent very, very very little time connecting the dots between what happens to in a world where most parents work, but they don't have jobs that provide them with the flexibility or the benefits or the resources to address conflicts between those, those jobs and what's happening to their children at home. Um, this is a place where um, we are sort of unequivocally the bottom of the barrel in terms of the OECD and a place where I think the long-term implications could be quite um, stark and quite strident for the U.S. So I, I think that I was glad um, the Secretary brought that up a little bit, but I think that this is a, a very critical area that we need to be focusing on if we care about this intersection between inequality and growth. Then a second area that we've been hearing a lot more about recently is in the area of demand. Um, we just uh, did an event with Atif Mian and Amir Sufi, who are two up-and-coming uh, young economists, um, one's at Princeton, one's at Chicago, who just wrote this book called House of Debt. And um, the, this is based on a series of economic research papers. And I want to make one plug for the way that they've done this. They um, did these very um, serious economics papers that appeared in the National Bureau of Economic Research and top-tier economic journals. And then they went the next, the extra step and have written a book that you could read in an afternoon that is accessible, that takes the kind of research they've done that only economists could read and actually made it very accessible for policymakers in House of Debt. And what they've done is shown that, that the way that we have inequality in the United States and the inequality in net worth was actually a key component in the cause of the economic crisis, because the crisis was caused by a fall in consumption, but that fall in consumption was um, specifically related to the ways that we saw debt increase in ways that were ab all about economic inequality. So thinking through the way that these mechanisms play out in our economy and where the policy levers are, um, I think, is the, is the next step. So, um, I want to just sort of uh, wrap up my comments here. I mean, I think that this is, it is an enormously important agenda around inclusive growth for, um, for our economic future here in the United States, for economic competitiveness. I, I think that, you know, for a long time now, we've posited this idea that there is this necessary trade-off between inequality and growth, and that that's just what economic efficiency is about, and we've kind of just sort of stopped there. I think it's very exciting to see a lot of new research pointing out that there isn't always a trade-off, and that, in fact, there are various, there are measurable and serious harms that we see uh, because of the ways that inequality has played itself out in, in our economy. And you have to dig a little bit deeper than just maybe looking at the overall Gini, but you have to look at exactly how inequality is um, playing itself out. And I'm very excited that the OECD is joining in, in thinking about this. Uh, Dr. Mathur, thank you for being here as well. Um, could you tell me, I know you'll have some prepared yeah. statements as well, but I hope you'll also 
uh, tell me a little bit about is this is this conversation going ahead in the right way, or is this is this just a flash in the pan? First, I would like to thank you, Daniel, and thanks to CSIS and the OECD for organizing this wonderful event uh, talk, to talk about this important issue about of income inequality and inclusive growth. Um, I think this is not a flash in a pan. You know, this is some this is a conversation that we have all the time. It's just that. President Obama made it the defining challenge of our time, and so we, we, you know, everybody is sort of focusing on it. But I think it's been an issue that's uh, been a part of debates, uh, political debate, uh, you know, debate amongst economists for a long, long time. And I, I don't think it's settled. I don't think uh, you know this is uh, sort of a conversation. This is where the conversation will end. This is not the point where we say, well, now we know that inequality does or does not lead to growth. I think it's a conversation that will keep happening. But to get back to the issue of uh, inclusive growth, uh, where, so where I would, you know, I, I think there is academic support for the idea that maybe inequality affects, you know, leads to adverse impacts on economic growth. But I think there's also support for the idea that inequality uh, does sometimes promote growth. You know, it depends on how we deal with the inequality. I think a lot of the policies um, that countries follow to to help uh, participants in in countries who are, you know, who are experiencing that inequality affects a lot how, how countries experience the growth. So, so, for, so for instance, in, in uh, the, the U.S., there's been a lot of discussion, uh, you know, earlier, uh, earlier this year about how do we even define income inequality. And, uh, you know, the Secretary General pointed out that inequality is ultimately a measurement issue. We, we can talk about it in terms of income, but we can also talk about it in terms of several other indicators. So we can look at education and health. Uh, in, in work that we've been doing at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, we've also looked at consumption inequality. And I would say that it's not unambiguously true that inequality measured from the perspective of consumption is actually growing worse or has widened to the same extent, at least, as income inequality. So if you look at how people are consume, consuming, you know, you, you compare the top quintile, the top 20% of the population with the bottom 20%, and you see that the ratio of consumption expenditures hasn't, uh, you know, grown or hasn't widened. The, the disparity hasn't widened as much as when you look at income. <coughs> Which is, of course, not to say that in inequality is not an issue. I mean, you know, whether we look at it from consumption or income, we obviously have measurement issues, and we obviously agree that you know there are people tremendous. There's tremendous amount of poverty out there, and we need to address that, and we need to help, uh, you know, people experiencing experiencing that, and we and we have social mobility issues. So what I would argue is, uh, instead of making the conversation about inequality. Uh, as the OECD is doing now, to shift the conversation towards inclusive growth. Because what does matter is not growth per se, because we don't know how it's getting redistributed, but when we have participants in the economy, every segment and sector of the population becoming a part of the growth process. Traditionally, we've always relied on sort of redistributive growth. We've looked at top-down policies. We've said, you know, growth matters. Let's cut taxes or let's, uh, you know, have uh, corporate tax reductions and let's move towards getting more investment and more uh, people employed and have, you know, even if the wealth gets concentrated at the top, we have a huge transfer system in the U.S. that's meant to take that income from the top, redistribute it to people at the bottom. And we've had several decades of that redistribution of the tax and transfer system. But as the Secretary General pointed out, we, you know, that creates only dependence in the system. That only creates a, 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 you know, a stream of people in poverty who are now dependent on social assistance and who are not being given the right opportunities to move out of that dependent framework to move towards the labor market. In fact, I think the, the, one, success, the one successful federal program that everyone looks to and which you also mentioned, the Earned Income Tax Credit Program, the reason we think of it as a success is not because it's actually you know, just simply giving cash assistance from the rich to the poor, it's actually getting people into the labor market. It's actually shown that these, you know, more than five million people in 2010 were in fact lifted out of poverty as a result of the EITC. So moving towards creating uh, self-sufficiency, I think, is the right path. And that's why the focus on inclusive growth and getting these participants in the labor market in the, in, as part of the growth process, rather than as dependents of the growth process, I think is extremely important. 
Um, I, I also want to talk about a, a lot of policies. So we, again, at, at AEI, we've been focusing, as the Secretary General has at the OECD, focusing on a lot of policies that we think could help people uh, move out of social safety nets and move up the income ladder, move you know, towards the American dream that, that uh, we all talk about, moving up, you know, sort of being uh, the, uh, the, 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 moving up the social mobility ladder. And so when you, when you talk about the labor market issue, one of the biggest problems and one of the reasons why we are focusing on income inequality and social mobility is the fact that the labor markets have been in a deep recession. I mean, ostensibly we had the economic recession end in 2009, but we've had a labor market recovery that's been abysmal. You know, anybody who's been unemployed over the course of the last five years would not, would not agree with the statement that we've had growth, that we've had an economic recovery in the U.S. We have about 10 million people who are unemployed and 3 million or more are long-term unemployed. So how do we get these people back into the labor market? What, what sort of policies do we need to help them? We can, you know, we can keep talking about taxing the rich, but that's ultimately not going to create self-sufficiency for these people who are at the bottom of the income ladder and who all they want is a job. So I think focusing on programs that end, you know, it's sort of dependence on the government, focusing on, uh, we had this huge debate about unemployment compensation and about how we should endlessly extend unemployment compensation for people in need. And I agree that people in need and people who are out of jobs need that unemployment compensation in order to sustain their families. But at the same time, if we had combined these compensation programs with better skills matching, with better jobs matching programs, I think you, know, you would have seen a better recovery for these participants, for, for these people who have been out of a job for six months, because at the end of that six months, or at the end of the two years, you know, those people are still out there, unemployed. You know, what do you do with them? So I think having more job matching programs where uh, people are actually, you know, uh, sort of tr provided skills training, matched to particular jobs, and maybe the employer has provided a subsidy so that they keep the worker for, a f for, a, for at least a six month period and see if it's a good match, keep them in these jobs programs would be a more active labor market policy. And we haven't seen much of that coming out of the administration. We have seen policies that you know, help the poor and help people in poverty and help people in need, but we haven't seen active labor market policies come out. Um, so, so we've also been sort of talking about education a lot. We know that low-income people, low-income students drop out of high school at five times the rate of middle-income students. How do we help these people? How do we, what sort of policies do we need to keep these people in, in school? Because it's a, you know, it's a huge predictor of their lifetime success. What they do in high school, whether they complete high school, whether they go on to college or vocational education, is a huge predictor of their lifetime incomes. So we've talked about sort of having pilot programs that would maybe provide cash assistance or, or a cash incentive to keep low-income people, to keep uh, you know, schools that have poor performing, poor performing high schools or high schools in poor neighborhoods, uh, provide them some sort of cash incentive to complete high school, and then an additional incentive maybe to either go to vocational schools or to go to college. Uh, just, and again, once you're in college, their, their studies, their academic studies showing, you know, we, we assume that the Pell Grant programs and all these you know, college assistance programs actually work really well, but a lot of them are targeted towards uh, you know, families earning more than 250% of income. So they're clearly you know, policies that we can change even within the existing framework without sort of adding on new systems. There, there, is, there, are, there is enough efficiency to, to be sort of gained from streamlining existing systems, from targeting them better, and uh, you know, help us to help with the mobility process. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Let me just, I, I want to hear from both of you, and I think you've, you've uh, detailed some of them here, Dr. Mathur, but I'd be interested in, uh, it sounds, when I listened to the Secretary General, he talked about four buckets of, of areas of work. One was on education and yeah. skills, another on labor policy reactivation, another on taxes, another on public services. And you've spoken about uh, job matching, skills training. Is that, in your mind, and I want to hear from Dr. Bushi yeah. about this as well, is that, in your mind, the the one that we should put most of our focus on is that if you were going to attack the uh, problems of unemployment or long-term unemployment and helping to bring about either, if we want to call it 
inclusive growth, or we want to call it solving, tackling inequality, if, depending on what frame you want to call this, is that the, the specific policy intervention you'd say is the one you should, you should prioritize? And I'd like to hear from Dr. Bush as well. If you had to choose from a menu, what would you pick? And is that, is that you know, I heard you, I think I'm hearing you say that, is that, would you, is that what you're saying? I would say that the, the current challenge is, of course, the labor market. I think if we, if we deal with you know, helping the pool of long-term unemployed get back into the labor market, that would be one of the biggest f challenges facing the economy today. We also have seen a tremendous growth in sort of single motherhood, single, single parent families. There's been a doubling of single parent families since the 1980s. And those are highly correlated with, with poverty because you know, single moms experience sort of double the rates of poverty than uh, you know, traditional two parent families. And as uh, Heather pointed out, you know, in order to get these women, again, this is linked to the labor market challenge, in order to get these women into the labor market, we need to reform sort of the child care tax credit programs, make them more, uh, expand the child care subsidies so that these women are able to get back into the labor market without worrying about uh, the cost of child care at the same time. So I think looking at labor markets uh, for the long-term unemployed, looking at labor markets for single mothers, and, and then in the long term, focusing on education uh, it would be sort of the priority areas uh, from my perspective. Dr. Bushi? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I, I, I certainly think that these four areas are, are of course, very important. Um, you know, where we are here in the United States at this point in the economic recovery, I agree with you, Aparna, is that uh, it's been, um, your word was abysmal, and that, you know, it's, it's been better than that, but certainly, you know, it's, it's down there. What we've seen is that the employment rate for uh, workers still is just a few tenths of a percentage points higher than it was in the worst days of the Great Recession. That means while we've created jobs, that job creation rate has been just about the same um, to soak up all of the new immigrants and new labor market um, entrants. It has not actually gotten people back to work to the way that we want. Um, that, I think, is a national tragedy. Um, these four areas that the Secretary outlined um, in some ways deal with that, but I think that the, that the first and number one economic priority has to be to get our country back to full employment. So I would actually add to this list um, a couple of things. I mean, one, uh, and I think some of this goes under public services, but here in the U.S., one of the things that we've allowed to um, uh, to deteriorate even as we have great need are investments in infrastructure. Um, actually, Secretary, as you were talking, and you were talking about the United States being um, slower than other countries um, in some policy areas, I kept thinking about trains, right? We don't have a transportation system that is consistent with what many other both developed and developing countries have. Um, and we also have a lot of people who need work. So this is the right time to do that. That, I think, is a, a, for the U.S. right now a fundamental part of an inclusive growth strategy. So including the XL Keystone Pipeline, I would assume, right? Mm. <laughs> that a infrastructure, but no, no. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I, mean, I, I thought I heard infrastructure, Trans I did. jobs, I energy. Said, I, no, I said transportation, okay. but we okay. can talk about green energy if you want. Um, uh, but I, so I think that's one issue. I mean, I think a second issue, uh, we do need to deal with the un, with the, we need, we need to deal with the continuing issues around um, consumption. So the U.S. Um, has moved from a country that was more investment driven than we are today to a country that is increasingly relied on consumption to boost our economic growth. Now, um, over the long term, as, family, as we've seen wages stagnate in the U.S. over the past few decades, families first coped with that stagnation by putting more people into the labor force. You saw rising women's labor force participation. And then in the 2000s, as you saw, that labor force participation rates flatten out for women and for men, and fall for men, actually. But um, you saw families taking on increasingly high levels of debt. That continues to be an enormous problem for American families, um, especially middle class and low income families. And you cannot have a sustained recovery that is entirely built on debt, especially debt that is so unequally distributed. As we've seen in the crisis, it's, it's toxic. So um, that, I mean, I think this is where thinking about if we want to have inclusive growth, there are policies that focus on the inclusivity, that focus on addressing inequality sort of directly, but I think there's other macroeconomic policies where we just need to be enormously attentive to the unequal ways that they play out across families because these also have macroeconomic implications. So both in infrastructure and in dealing with the foreclosure crisis and the crisis of debt and the 
uh, potential larger uh, uh, issue now that we're seeing in student debt. Those will also be areas I'd focus on. Okay. Um, let's see here. I think I'm going to ask the Secretary General to come back up here, and we're going to take a couple questions from the audience, and so you'll, you'll take some as well. Why don't you get her, why don't you, why don't you actually uh, join us, actually, why don't you join us at the podium, and I'll, or actually, why don't you sit here, we'll have you, we'll have you sit here. Okay, great. So let me first uh, ask you a question, Mr. Secretary General, and then what we'll do is, I guess now that the, it's not um, the twenty two, you know, so just right. You want to give the full view of the, the everybody. Yes. Uh, could you tell me why if you were working on this issue before inequality was cool, if you will, uh, or we're going to call it inclusive growth was cool? Um, could you tell me what has changed? Why why has this changed? You alluded to it a little bit, maybe around the crisis, but. Could you tell me what, and maybe is it just President Obama's put this on the agenda, what, what is all of a sudden, why is this, this, a, this a hotter topic than it was, say, three or four years ago? First of all, because it, it already existed and it was growing before the crisis. And we should have, and in fact, we denounced it, we measured it, we benchmarked it, we came out with it, and we, the first document about growing an equal is, is before the crash. By the way, everybody is sitting on a B key like this, or U.S. B key, uh, and, and uh, they have the documents uh, about divided we stand, growing and equal, house life, 2013, uh, uh, focus on top topic, top, 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 oh, oh, everything you always wanted to know, but we're afraid to this ask. This is an about. OECD party favor. Yes, uh, you know. And this is this is this is to avoid uh, too many uh, trees from being. That's thrown. right, exactly. But this is the one we're presenting today. And that, again, I understand that you're sitting on it or have it available or it's out there in a, in a, in a table. So uh, you can have everything that we've talked about and all the documents we're referred to right here. So uh, the answer uh, to your question, as I said, is this was already happening. We measured it, we talked about it, we denounced it, we did not get a lot of uh, audience, but still, uh, second, it grew more from 2009, 10, and 11 than in the 12 years before the crisis. Now, the second delivery is the divided we stand. That goes into the first year, three years of the crisis. And Stefano's outfit, which is working now on uh, the uh, uh, last, let's say, the, the, the second three years of the crisis, or going into 12, 2012, 2013, is precisely looking at now the whole of the period of the crisis. Uh, and there was a, not an acceleration. There was just a dramatic going, moving into another orbit of the problem. So why is it now suddenly? It's not suddenly. It's because it became too big. I have to say that <laughs> is it, inequality used to be cool. <laughs> well. What happened is that people said inequality is natural, inequality is normal. Yeah, but we're not saying the outcomes have to be equal. What we're saying is opportunities have to be equal. The inputs may be equal. Of course, some people will work harder, some people are smarter, some people will go the extra mile, some people have a PhD, and some people will stay at the technical level, and that will define uh, differences. The, the only question is, are they having those differences if they could have something different, can they choose, can they opt for something better or uh, for something more? And the problem is they can't. So this is, it's not that we are discovering this. This is not uh, coming out of the blue. Um, inequality was already rearing its ugly head before, but it just has become too big and it has become a true, real, as Heather suggested, a real obstacle to the conduct of economic policy. It's no longer a question of, again, ethical or moral. It's about uh, uh, economic policy delivery. Thank you very much. I want to hear from our friend from the Ford Foundation, Anna Marie. If you could, uh, we've got a microphone for you, and then I've got, I know there's several thoughtful people in the audience who have, have questions or comments as well. Thank you very much. I would really like to. Please. Anna Marie from the Ford Foundation. I'm a senior advisor on the Just Cities. 
um, initiative and um, on behalf of Darren Walker, our president, and our Zad Briggs, who couldn't be here with us, um, I really salute the leadership of the Ford Foundation. We have always been, uh, of the OECD, we've always been at the Ford Foundation very interested in these social justice issues, and we've been talking for a long time about it. It's not a moral imperative, so it's really fantastic to see this first step, and I hope that there's many other reports without question marks at the end um, that give us some information. Um, we've talked a lot about the four pillars and the data. Um, given that um, with the Just Cities initiative, I'm wondering, we know we have a little bit of a blueprint what um, national governments can do, but I'm wondering if you're a mayor in a city or if you're working in a metropolitan region, what can you do on that level? If the federal government is maybe um, a little bit lagging, what can we do um, on, on those, on, on different regions? Why don't we take a couple questions? We'll do this World Bank style. I, I want to hear from some of my friends. I see Charlie Heater here, as well as my friend John Simon. We'll take these two more, so we have these three, and then we'll have uh, both the Secretary General and perhaps my uh, panel colleagues have a chance to respond. Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and, and thank you to the Secretary General and the panelists for a great discussion. Um, my name is Charles Heater. I chaired the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD for seven years recently, stepped down. Um, my question is this, I've listened now for an hour and 15 minutes or so, and I haven't heard the words business or private sector. And they still make up the major part of the economy. And I think I nine in 10 jobs <laughs> in the world I think are generated by the private right. sector, but what, what do I know? It's, it's yeah. seen, I, I, <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think the role of business is here, both in private sector-led growth, uh, addressing the issues of skills, of reactivation of employees, and so forth, because I think there's a lot going on in the private sector, and it can be extremely helpful with the right policies. J John Simon. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for a very compelling presentation and for the panelists. I think it's fairly clear the case for um, uh, addressing inequality, both in the developed world and throughout the world as a whole, uh, both for economic fairness issues, but also for economic efficiency, for, for growth issues, has been pretty well laid out. And the four policy baskets that you presented seem, seem right, at least to, to my uh, uh, eye. But there is, there are two, one issue you mentioned and one issue d you didn't mention, which uh, I would take issue with. One is the minimum wage. Um, and I think the evidence on whether the minimum wage has an impact on employment is fairly ambiguous. But the evidence on whether the minimum wage has an impact on low-skilled employment and the employment of people at the bottom of the income spectrum is actually much less ambiguous. In fact, it tends to p take those people out of the um, employment uh, system and therefore increase inequality in that way. So I want to understand your analysis on that and how you would advocate for that as an anti-inequality measure as opposed to some other measure, which I think you could argue for it for other reasons. Um, and the second thing you did not mention is transfer payments, entitlement payments, both in terms of the federal entitlement programs, but also in terms of the public pension systems, which squeeze out the resources available for uh, uh, many of the programs that you described, and instead wind up putting a lot of resources into the hands of the middle class. And of course, it's great to put resources into the hands of the middle class, but if, as we have now, where the eldest cohorts in our population are much above average in terms of wealth, and they're getting most of the benefits of these transfer payments, and the youngest cohorts in our population are below average in terms of wealth, and they're having their programs cut. Isn't that an area that's ripe for policy intervention? Thank you. My friend John is the reason I went to the Kennedy School. He, um, John has served in the, in the Bush administration together, but he also served in state government, so he knows both the foreign policy and foreign assistance world, but also knows state government as well, so I think it's a Appropriate. We'll take those three. So why don't we start with you, Mr. Secretary General, and then we'll ask the panelists to, to respond. If we have time, we'll capture some more questions. But could, take those three and, and respond as you will. Multi-level government or governance is one of the biggest challenges for every single policy. But when you're talking about inclusive growth, it is the key to effectiveness. There has to be very close coordination because the services are delivered at the local government because uh, sometimes you have state uh, or regional, depending on whether European or American or whatever, because this is, applies to all the members and non-members of the OECD. And then, of course, you have the national budgets and you have national policies such as education or such as health or such as 
uh, the entitlements uh, uh, that, that um, uh, have to be applied. So the governance and the, the government and the execution and implementation of an appropriate coordination between the different layers is absolutely critical. So uh, Ms. Lagos uh, mentioning or reminding us, if you're a mayor, you know, the mayors always get together to talk about, to talk bad about the governments, and the governments and the ministers are always getting together to criticize the mayors about how much they spend and all the problems that they have, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, they're both wrong. No, they're both, they're both, <laughs> they're both, they're both a little bit right and a little bit wrong, I'd say. Uh, we, we've been on both sides. Uh, you know, when we say we, I've been we because she just uh, left the service of uh, Secretary Donovan uh, to join the Ford Foundation, but was working precisely on issues of cities and transport and infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, we're working together there on that. Uh, and, and I have to say, this is, uh, you could say, as, as uh, the mayor of um, Montreal said to us yesterday, and Mayor Bloomberg was reminding us also, or Ram Emanuel, or the mayor of Stockholm, said, this is where things happen. And therefore, this is where the money should be. You know, this is, but devolution or decentralization, especially when it, you decentralize services like health, or you decentralize services like education, but there is not a robust enough fiscal base in those government entities, either regional, state, or municipal, that have to deliver the services, are going to deliver there for bad services. And that is another source of inequality, because uh, yeah, there has to be some kind of leveling of the, of the playing field, and that has to do with resources. So you have mentioned another dimension of inequality creation, but also, if you look at it positively, another uh, d you know, dimension of the solution. Um, so uh, Charlie Heater uh, reminds us, uh, what about business? What about the private sector? Well, when you're talking about skills, it's for the workforce to be able to be employed by the private sector. I'm not suggesting that the government is going to do. The government should help, together with the private sector, to the skilling, the upskilling, the reskilling, uh, the education, the innovation. But the government has to provide the broader competition context. But then the private sector is the one who has to provide the investment and the jobs. So I would say yes. I'd say everything we've been talking about is for them to be employable, for them to have more attractive opportunities, but more importantly, this is not a discussion about austerity against, uh, against uh, growth, or it is about the only way in which you can actually improve the wages and improve the question of inequality or reduce inequality, which is by providing the workforce with the elements to be not only more employable, but also to have better access uh, because they are uh, better skilled. So uh, they come together. Uh, the target is, of course, as I said, it's, it's about the private sector. And if, assume that the lowest 20% of the population, which today is the most vulnerable in the case of the United States, were reskilled, upskilled, better prepared, more sophisticated into their, in, in their, their knowledge and their skills, go in a workforce, go into the private sector that would then be allowed to move more into more, more knowledge-based, therefore more value added. We now know that it's a value added that counts rather than uh, this high nominal numbers of trade in the world. Uh, then you would get upward mobility, social mobility, but you will also get more productivity and more competitiveness. So it's a kind of a win-win. Um, now, minimum wages and jobs and skills, and we strongly support the minimum wage as a minimum, uh, as the French say, the socle de protection, as a, a protection so that you cannot have workers being 
uh, uh, paid lesser than what is considered the um, the, the the minimum you know dignified revenue necessary to to survive. No. The question is the following. I don't know a single country where minimum wage is relevant in terms of the business transactions every day and the cost of workers. It's a unit, and the minimum wage is a unit. People gain a multiple of the minimum wage, or lower or higher multiple of the minimum wage, depending on working conditions, depending on skills, depending on uh, the productivity of the workers, etc. But the fact that there would be a minimum wage, let's say, take the case of Germany, where we just passed the idea of a minimum wage. Germany did not have a minimum wage, and they were doing, thank you very much, very well. Ah, but were they doing very well, thank you very much, or was everybody doing very well, thank you very much? No. We actually discovered in Germany, which is kind of the shining cathedral of well, best practices for labor markets and everything else, that you had people that were 400, 600, uh, you know, seven, 800 euros per month when, in theory, the minimum wage was 1,200 or 1,300, et cetera. Now, where does an 850, um, uh, again, talking Germany, where was an 850 uh, per hour minimum wage take you? Well, it takes you pretty much to kind of the middle of the rankings. It's not going to uh, make Germany lose any productivity because uh, they are paying on average a multiple of that, but it's going to allow pr for protection and second, it is going to allow those who are at that level or below to um, have a certain guarantee. Now, in the case of the United States, the 1010 that is being proposed, this hasn't been legislated or just, you know, approved. It's only now applicable to pr public sector employees, which can be uh, paid more because of, or paid the minimum wage because of uh, executive uh, order. But again, it takes you into what I would call, you know, the, the, the averages. I don't think uh, it's going to uh, and, and you can actually compensate with productivity and competitiveness. I'd say almost the opposite of what you suggested, that an uh, increase in the minimum wage would be opposed to a skilling or upskilling. No, I would say that this would be a very great incentive. And I would also say that it would create something which is not so obvious in the American workforce, in the American workplace which is a minimum sense of loyalty and belonging by the workforce vis-a-vis -vis the employer and vice versa. Here, the solution to a crisis or a problem or a drop in the order book is a pink slip. In Germany, what they did was to say, okay, one hour less, two hours less, three hours less. We divide the cost of that Kurzarbeit. And in the meantime, what do we do? We use the one hour, the two hours, or the three hours in order to train the workforce. That means somebody has to pay for it, and that's the private sector paying for it, the government paying for it, and also the worker paying for it. And what is the result? Germany has a lower rate of unemployment than before the crisis, but they now have a more productive, better prepared, more competitive workforce than they had before the crisis. And in the post-crisis period, it is those countries that took those kinds of decisions that are going to take to eat our cheese. You know Why? Because it's going to be cutthroat competition to recover the jobs, to recover the well-being, and to recover the exports that were lost. Let me I might just suggest that your two panelists just also reflect on some of those questions. If you each can have a minute and just keep it to a minute and you can either, <laughs> okay? Please, Dr. Mathur. Yeah, uh, so let me combine the uh, policies at the metropolitan or the city state level with uh, sort of the corporate sector side of it. I think we are seeing a lot of initiatives on, at the state level that are coming the from the private system sector system as well. System and system a lot of the policies that I talked about are things that you can implement at the state level. So I think it's, Talking about policies is a lot more productive because it's going to help with social mobility a lot 
more at that level than at the federal level where there's so much rift between the parties. But, on the, uh, but at the state level, there, there are initiatives like the Wisconsin Fast Forward Initiative where employers are sort of recruiting employees to train them, the government is subsidizing them for a period of a few months, and then the requirement is that the employers keep them, you know, keep them employed beyond that period. So there, there are a lot of state initiatives that we're seeing that are helping with the labor market crisis and with the unemployment issues, and I think that the private sector is extremely, extremely important in, in sort of spearheading the recovery. Uh, in terms of, for the minimum wage issue, I mean, uh, if the tool is, the talk has been about using minimum wages to fight poverty, and I would argue that it's not the best tool to fight poverty. We know that less than 20% of people on minimum wages are actually in poverty. And the CBO report suggested that increasing the minimum wage would actually lead to significant, you know, disemployment effects. So we know the negative impacts from the minimum wage. Uh, why not expand something like the EITC? If we have the money, expand the EITC, expand it to childless adults so that we know that a program that's actually successful in getting people into the labor market is the program that we focus on rather than something that would lead to more uh, unemployment in the current economy. Dr. Bushi, you have the last word. Oh, how exciting. Um, so I wanted to just pull together a comment um, on all three of the questions uh, by uh, tying together the minimum wage and uh, an answer that, that gets at all three. Um, you know, first, I think here, uh, the, the research in the United States on the minimum wage definitely shows that it can be an excellent labor market policy, uh, both in terms of wages, but is not shown to have economically significant uh, job losses. Even the Congressional Budget Office in its famous report that came out this spring said that job gains were within the 90 percent confidence interval, so it's very difficult to see that this is a job killer. Um, further, there is substantial evidence that raising the minimum wage actually both improves productivity and, critically, uh, reduces turnover. So this actually has a positive economic effect at the firm level, which I think is um, often, uh, we don't talk about that enough, but there's a lot of evidence for it. Um, so uh, uh, Anna Marie, and Anne Marie, and Anna Marie, Anna Marie had asked about what we can do at the state and local level, and here I would point to the minimum wage as something that we're seeing a lot of vitality at both um, the the city and the state level. Um, there are a basket of labor and job quality issues that you can deal with the local level, and one of the things that's been happening though in cities around the country is as they are seeking to enact ordinances or laws around job quality, you're actually seeing states come in and say, no, you can't actually do that. And I think that's actually an area that we aren't thinking enough about. So for example, um, uh, in uh, Milwaukee, they implemented a paid sick days um, by, uh, uh, by ballot. Uh, it was on the, the um, uh, what did they call that? At any rate, where the, the, the people voted that in um, by like 70 percent, but then the state said, no, no, you don't have the right to actually um, do that kind of regulation. So I think that's a, that's a place that we could be playing in terms of inclusive growth um, and, again, also having productivity effects. And then finally, um, on leadership by the business community, um, again, sort of pointing to the minimum wage as this example to lead to these answers, um, you've seen a lot of leadership around the country on this issue as it's been put on the political agenda, and that's been very interesting. Um, you know, I'd point to The Gap, who's kind of been out there in front, but there have been another of other companies as well. I mean, they think that the one thing that, I mean, certainly the vast majority of jobs are being created in the private sector, and I think there's there's two issues that I just want to underscore. I mean, one, um, the United States has been, is, uh, is not a great place to open, to, to be an entrepreneur, to open your own business, to have a small business relative to other OECD countries. I think that's a really big question. I have a lot of questions as to why that's not the case. Um, certainly some of the research I've seen points to the lack of uh, inclusive policies, the lack of universal health coverage, the things that make it much more riskier here to go out and set out your own shingle than it would in other countries. What could we be doing to spark entrepreneurship and small businesses by thinking about what people need uh, to make that happen um, in a sort of very practical sense? And then I, it would be wonderful to see the private sector stepping up more um, to help uh, talk about the things that, they, that we see matter to them. Like we saw, you know, uh, the importance of skills. Uh, you know, it would be really wonderful to hear more voices of business leaders in the debates around how we should be investing in education or early childhood, um, that I think too often those voices aren't as strong in terms of how those investments are so important for our long-term economic future. You certainly hear them, but it would be wonderful to hear more. Okay. I think we have to end it here. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the Secretary General.